Okay, so let's start. Hi, everyone. Welcome to PostgreSConf, which is now having a talk on accessibility, um, which is important because I think that every conference actually needs to have a diversity um, drive. My name is uh, Rory. I'm actually a evangelist for a small startup uh, out of uh, Seattle called Microsoft. I don't know if any of you have heard about the, we're, we're doing pretty well, I think so. And m my role is really to drive awareness in uh, technical audiences around Azure and Microsoft products. And one of the, the key things that I, I drive is uh, awareness of how to incorporate accessibility into your coding standards and also how to use Microsoft products for accessibility. Just a caveat, there is no real um, expectation that you've had or uh, started your accessibility journey. I'm going to assume that everyone has never seen or even heard around the, the word accessibility because this is a very emotional topic. But if you just start with a journey, you'll see how easy it is to get started. So first, Microsoft loves open source. We're at an open source convention here. So if I can just give you a brief introduction to why we love open source. Um, 2012, TypeScript. 2014, um, we actually started engaging with GitHub, which then we, we started to marry GitHub, and we bought GitHub in, I think, 2017. Um, yeah, 2018. In 2018, we also noticed that Microsoft was trending towards more than 50% utilization of Linux on Azure. And now I'm proud to say that we use more Linux than we do Windows on Microsoft Azure. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a crazy world we live in. We've also uh, launched development centers in Africa, so we're heavily involved in Africa. And we have the first hypervisor data centers in the African continent. So yeah, so we're very focused to uh, open source, and um, yeah, we'll carry on with that with that journey. But this isn't the point of this talk. This talk is actually tell you about my little midlife crisis. So as part of my midlife crisis, I purchased a 335i BMW. It's not the best idea to buy a car as a part of a midlife crisis, and to to get the car to uh, be adjusted for my pedals, I then went and created some pedals, and then I bolted them on to my car. And it's really the theme of this talk that for many, many people and for, for years before, we, we saw accessibility as a means, uh, sorry, as a bolt-on, as an after effect. Like if you, if you go back into your, your website, your website already exists, but you're going to try and make it accessible. And it's very similar to how I respond to a lot of things, though. I, I bolt on things. This is me speaking at University of Bloemfontein, uh, and I'm trying to actually get through to everyone, so I'm standing on a chair. And this is me also trying to get coffee at one of my employers, and um, yeah, so I just, you make a plan. Historically, we've also seen this being utilized in uh, the accessibility community. So this is called the sip and puff switch for limited movement. Um, and you, using your cheek muscles, you would actually drive your computer in that regard. This is also the key lo keyless keyboard, a mechanism that you can move your keyboard around. Visual impairments, you have the refreshable Braille keyboard. And then also the screen reader, JAWS and NV Access being the the two main plays in that space, though. But all of these are after the fact, um, because there hasn't been a conscious movement to engage with accessibility-driven design. But we were in the fourth industrial revolution. And as part of my midlife crisis also, I bought one of those BMR scales. Um, yeah. um, and I, I, I put it down, and I. Um, it, it asked me some queries, and I put my, my height, four foot one, 120 centimeters, weight, 65 kilos, and then it had a, an option for a crawling baby or a adult man. And I thought, oh, this is not going to end well. And I, I, like, I chose, okay, one of them, and then it, it did some calculation. You can see it had like a machine model somewhere, and it was saying, hold on, calculating, calculating, and came out, and it called me like, you know, the most heinous like words, saying like I had a B, I, I should be dead actually like that. But I felt a little bit like sad Affleck, because 
there was no way that I could actually bolt on any changes to this device. There was no way that I could actually say, fourth industrial revolution, slow down, cater for people with accessibility issues. So I gave myself a, a challenge. Um, yeah, this, this makes a, a lot less sense now that he's had his, uh, yeah, I'm not going to ruin it for you people. Um, but I gave myself a challenge. I was going to speak in and around South Africa and uh, actually internationally on how to, and the easiest way to start with accessibilities. And that way I could make sure that I've done my chance or my bit to uh, make sure that the fourth industrial revolution doesn't leave me behind. So what are we going to talk about today? First of all, we're going to go through inclusive design. And inclusive design is a really, really old concept. Inclusive design actually predates to the 1920s, where um, the US military started making cockpits for, for pilots. So they said, hey, let's, let's review some pilots. So they took the measurements of 4,000 pilots. And uh, through that measurement, they found the, the average height for the pilot. And they go, OK, cool. We're going to create all of the cockpits to cater for that average, that average person. And then in the 1930s and 40s, they started having these unnecessary high amounts of crashes. In the 1950s, they went back and said, let's, let's re-look at what we did there. And, and they said, OK, cool, 4,000 people. And in the middle there of the average, let's find that person. And that person didn't exist. Because catering for the average is actually catering for no one. And inclusive design is what's called user-centered design. But inclusive design is the reason why all of you can have adjustable cars. Because the cockpit's then equated to uh, your car cockpit. And you have a million permutations with that. The height, the, the actual um, depth, all of that and that. And that's... That's really inclusive design. We're going to go through a, a nice little example of exactly how easy it is to get started with that. Then we're going to look like web, uh, at w website standards. Now, why web? Because re web really is the entry point to uh, a lot of people's worlds, their digital worlds, though. And web accessibility is at the forefront of what's coming up. And finally, we're going to look at AR. There was a design process. There was a model for that scale. And I wanted to know exactly how it was created and how I could actually change a AI to be accessible. Inclusive design. So first, let's understand what accessibility is. And then we can understand how to design for it. So accessibility is the design of products, services, and environments so that everyone, including people with disabilities, can fully experience them. It's not designing for disabilities. And that's a very important concept. And what accessibility promises, if you go in with the right mindset, is that you can go from your design process to innovation. And this has been statistically proven that companies who focus on accessibility are more profit, uh, profitable, up to 20% more. And how is that possible? How is it possible that by focusing on accessibility, you can actually drive in innovation and be more profitable. First, what it isn't. So accessibility, if defined with this, is not a personal health condition. So disability is not a personal health condition. Disability is a mismatched human interaction. Have you ever been to a doctor and you're going to them, go, I'm not feeling too good, and he goes, I'm sorry, you've got disability. It doesn't exist. The, have you ever been into a car and you, you can't really feel comfortable in that car and you can't adjust it perfectly or a chair? Guess what? According to that chair, you're disabled. And I had an interesting epiphany when I was reading this because I thought to myself, if this is applicable to us, how much more than to children? So I went to my, my son, who's also a uh, short statured like me, and I said to him, um, when do you feel disabled? And he goes, uh, well, only when I can't do something, like when you go in the scale and everything. And this is an important concept to understand with accessibility, because you, you really only define disability as when it is a mismatch human interaction. So we've defined accessibility, and we've also defined what is and what isn't disability. So now let's, with those concepts, let's look at some design steps around how you can do inclusive design. So First step, recognize exclusion. So there was a, a, a large Silicon Valley company, 
and it started recruiting people, and it built into that machine model the, the recruitment process, and then eventually after 10 years, it realized, wait a second, we had stopped recruiting women. So what had happened is the machine model had worked out that all of the, the people they were recruiting were men, so anyone who mentioned women or women in tech, don't recruit them. But that exclusion mindset is important because that needs a human engagement. So first step, recognize exclusion, understand bias. Two, solve for one, extend to many. We can go through the persona spectrums, persona spectrums of how to do that. But my promise to you is that if you solve for one persona spectrum, you will cater for many and extend to many. We'll see how. And three, learn from diversity. What we're seeing with the fourth industrial revolution is the ability to adjust your entire customer journey by actually uh, manipulating your process and your engagement through AI. We'll see how also. Persona spectrum. So this comes from the US Center of, uh, for Disabilities and the most common uh, use case for this is someone without the use of their arm. So this person might be an amputee or they might be born without an arm, and the top there, and we have the limited access to the arm. Number two is an arm injury. Someone like myself who has been in IT for 22 years and has like tennis elbow and repetitive strain injury that can't actually use uh, their arm. And finally, a new parent. So all you new parents here will know that this is like a, it's like a temporary disability, uh, both financially, mentally, physically, there's a lot to go with, with, with children. If you go in with the first one and you go into your manager or your stakeholders and you say to them, I'd like to cater for, for someone with uh, amputees. There's 26,000 in the, the US like that. You would never be able to justify the budget spend for that. The second one, 13 million. The third one, 8 million. By catering for one persona spectrum, you're actually catering for 21 million people. This is an important concept to understand because how many people have accessibility needs? There are more than 1 billion people with accessibility needs in the world. So if you find the right pers uh, persona spectrum, you can actually make it financially viable to code towards that. So once you have your persona spectrums, then you take your journey, your, uh, your user journey, and you superimpose that over your standard engagement. So over here we have a uh, web shopping cart. I've got my registration, my navigation, and my checkout. Registration, you've got your site landing preferences, registration, help, login. On navigation, you've got search products, add to cart, help. Checkout, you've got checkout, shipping, and then obviously a, a survey for the user's experience. So we take our users there, and the entire journey changes. We know that we can cater for 21 million people, and those 21 mil million people would engage with your site differently. So on your site landing, responsive design. On your registration, you have a capture, and not like the one that Google's uh, trying to use so I can actually capture uh, a street sign, because I know what they're on, hey? Like, there's some kind of like conspiracy to kind of work out like what do street signs look like or stop signs, and I've been training them for years. And then you have font and color options for visual impairment, accessibility help test if they need a phone in for help, single sign for logon, navigation, one button access, voice search, help, a callback option, checkout, SMS, email alerts, one button checkout, and then very importantly, right at the end of it, instead of a survey, you have an AI adjusting the entire experience to cater for them at, based on their feedback. And that comes back to uh, the, the third point is to be able to change to cater for fourth industrial revolution changes. Now, not only can you cater for the standard population, you can cater for another 21 million people just by adding these changes. Website accessibility. So, how did the web get this drive for accessibility? One would like to think that it is our altruistic motives that we've migrated into a new level of human consciousness as this quote kind of says, for most of human history, we put our innovative capacity into improving the quality of life. Because we're living longer, our focus is starting to shift into improving the quality of life. Bill Gates, stick and carrot. This is the carrot. We're trying to actually make everyone's life easier and be altruistic. But of course, 
There's also the stick legislation. We've seen this now with GDPR. How many of us have suddenly gone, oh, I should tell people about cookies. I should warn them about cookies and everything. You still got my cookies. Why are you telling me now that you're going to store my, my cookies? But it's a knee-jerk reaction because we've finally realized that we can't deal with anyone who has European access if we don't adhere to legislation. It's the same with accessibility. We're about to actually experience that same drive. So we've got the US Century uh, in Integrated Digital Experience Act. Also, the EU, EU Parliament Directive of Digital Accessibility that says by 2020, all publicly facing mobile and websites will adhere to WCAG 2.1, which is the website accessibility, or up to $100,000 fine per day. Canada's actually started to implement that. So that's coming. Stick and carrot, altruism and legislation. So now that I've got your attention, let's actually go through WCAG 2.1 and see how you can actually conform to it with website accessibility. So WCAG, it's very old. So version one has already been out since 1999 and it's primarily focused on mobility and visual impairment. 2.0 extended that. And then 2.1 started to notice, wait a second, we're, we're not actually catering for all of those personas. Remember those personas? And the personas also included people with low visibility, mobile users, and learning disabilities. ADHD, um, autism, and the entire spectrum of people who are not really, the visibility isn't really aware, but is a learning disability. So once you have those guidelines, Let's look at the compliance levels. So level A deals with the most basic web accessibility features. Level AA signifies the biggest and most common barriers for disabled users. Captioning your videos would be level AA. Catering for correct font usage would be level A. And then finally, level AAA. This is really catering primarily, especially for people with disabilities. And we're going to go through exactly how you can do that now. So we've got. Uh, what is WCAG and the categories. Let's also look at the four main accessibility principles in WCAG. So first of all, perceivable. Can you see it? Operable, can you use it? Understandable, can you understand it? And finally, robust. It won't break future technologies. And I'm going to give an example for each one of these three, and we'll talk through also some of the compliance levels. Perceivable. So this is an apex predator that a lot of you actually introduce into your house and you treat it as a pet. And it's got an alt text. So a screen reader will actually go into this image and it will read back cute cat instead of apex predator. But that's perceivable. That's what kind of the expectation is to do with this with web accessibility. Create your alt text. Now the nice thing about Microsoft products, Word, PowerPoint, even Excel, is that we've incorporated AI um, accessibility features that it will do it for you. So if you have a cat and you go check accessibility in Microsoft Office, it will say, can we actually uh, put the captions for you, sorry, the alt text for you, and it will go and say cat. So a lot of these are pretty easy to do when you incorporate with AI. Perceivable also, one out of 20 males are colorblind. One out of 200 females are uh, colorblind. So how many of us actually use color to indicate alerts or errors or information on the web? So here's an example of one where you're uh, highlighting the incorrect email address with red, but to someone who's colorblind, they wouldn't be able to see it. So this is my hero, Ron Swanson of Parks and Recreation. He likes whiskey, carpentry, um, and meat. And um, you'll notice that he's been captioned here as laughs, which is completely against his persona. But if you just take your video and you chuck it into a, a video editor and you just leave it alone, your, your captions are not going to come out correctly. So we've, we've created a captioning uh, tool, and you'll see here in a video that I'm going to play later on, that it uses Azure AI, and it's called um, Video Indexer. And it gives you 5,000 minutes for free, and it allows you to do all of that into multiple languages. So there's a lot of nice tools out there that allow you to do this properly. But don't just take your video and 
throw it onto the interweb and expect it to be captioned. Also spend some time and just make sure those captions are not like Ron Swanson laughing. Perceivable also. So this is a really bad example of a hyperlink. So you can see here that someone actually pasted hyperlink into a newspaper. <laughs> but this is also an example of someone expecting to do something and getting a different result. If you were to also use that hyperlink in a screen reader and you didn't have an alt text for it, the person who was visually impaired would just hear, and this is a hyperlink, click here. They wouldn't get given the option to be able to understand where to go. This is my favorite keyboard, the Stack Overflow Control C and V keyboard, though. So most, we're, we're developers, right? We're going to check the web first. But how many of us have taken a website or an application and switched our mouse off and tried to navigate it with just our keyboards? So what's the first knee-jerk reaction? The first knee-jerk reaction is to go and make it navigable. But then when we leave or the company changes, we stop doing that and we change the tab index. So that's a very important concept to understand though. Make sure your site is navigable by keyboard, but also make sure, and we'll see later on, that you don't actually introduce the stumbling block for people with accessibility issues. Let's have a look at operable. So this is a, a clean little bit of uh, HTML, we've got the heading section with some P tags, and then we've got the uh, list. Pretty simple. But I can also render this in a terrible way. It will look the exact same. And this is the HTML tag semantically made, created in a way that we would be able to see it, but to someone who's using a screen reader software, almost impossible because now the list is no longer a list the screen reader won't be able to actually say list item number one, list item number two. It'll just read it. Understandable. So one of my pet projects is to collect um, incorrect usage of volume indexes and, and GIFs showing like, you know, poor design. And this is a volume control where someone is actually pumping a bicycle pump to get the volume at the correct level. But there's also one that you have to screen, scream into your uh, computer to get the volume at the right level. And finally, the most difficult that I've ever tried to use is the gear ratio. So you can actually do the gears. You can try this yourself also, and you can accelerate and clutch. I, I, I've got an automatic car. I don't even know what a clutch is and to get the volume there. But this is an important concept, though, because a lot of times we perceive what is understandable to us as understandable to everyone else, whereas someone who actually has ADHD or autism or attention deficit wouldn't be able to operate on the same level as us. Colors, flashes, um, engagements are different to them. Robust, and finally robust, the last uh, principle. To someone who has accessibility requirements, they surf and they use their devices in landscape mode. That's the majority of them. And yes, we've had a push for responsiveness, probably because of budgeting or you know, customer usage of everything. But also, we want to be able to use it in a landscape mode for accessibility requirements. So this is a, another apex predator, the Dutch hunt. Actually, one of the only dogs that has ever bitten me. That's in a cocker spaniel, hey? So now we've looked at what perceivable is and how to cater for it, but what about the other the side, the AAA, on how to actually cater for disabilities? It's an important concept to understand. And I introduced to you ARIA, the Web Accessibility Initiative Access Rich Internet Applications, aka WAR ARIA. So we're just going to call it ARIA. And it breaks it up into role <laughs> attributes, live regions, landmark roles, states and properties. And this is being able to, for example, for a, a screen reader, really kind of say this person coming in has an accessibility requirement, I'm going to give him a richer experience. ARIA is markup. It looks and feels exactly like HTML. So we've got a role, main equals role, a state, and a property. And it's really giving the, ex the, the screen reader the real kind of, instead of visually, but I am now going to represent the state in ARIA. ARIA is HTML5. Did you ever notice how, why HTML5 
4 took so long to get to HTML5. And then suddenly they just managed to get there. There was something even before that. It was called ARIA. And ARIA was semantically signed because you had to be semantically signed for a screen reader to be able to read the page. So notice that on the left we've got ARIA. Uh, we've got article, header, navigation, complementary. And suddenly now on HTML5 we've got very similar tags though. Because they realize, wait a second, there is already a, a community that is semantically uh, using a new version of HTML5. Let's base it on that. Do you know how hard it was to find a picture of Fight Club Lego? <laughs> <laughs> so this is Fight Club Lego. And um, the first rule of ARIA is, like Fight Club, no ARIA is better than bad ARIA. If you create bad ARIA, and we'll look at some examples now, you can put a stumbling block in for someone with accessibility requirements. The second rule of ARIA is, if you use semantically sound HTML5, you're already using ARIA. Let's look at some bad examples of how you could use ARIA. So first of all, principle one, a role is a promise. If you're going to do something, you make sure that you are actually doing that. So ARIA pressed equals to false, mute. Principle two, ARIA can both cloak and enhance creating both power and danger. So over here, I have a, a hyperlink, and it's a menu item. So assistive tech users perceive this element as an item in a menu, not a link. Because I'm actually trying to make it into a menu item, but it's, a, it's an actual hyperlink. Number two, assistive tech users can only perceive the contents of the ARIA label and not the link text. So assistive tech users won't actually see link text, they'll only see the ARIA. So you see why in the beginning I said to them, if you're going to actually cater for uh, people with accessibility requirements, make sure you understand how to, because you can actually make it more difficult than easy by doing that. So keep calm, it's demo time, and I give you the, uh, the X pipeline samples. You can access that, github.com forward slash Microsoft X pipeline samples. Um, Office.com, Azure, uh, all of the Microsoft sites have already been for many years uh, mandated to be accessibility uh, ready. And we recently open source our entire tool chain. So one is I want to show you a Chrome plugin that you can use, and two is I want to show you actually how to do this with DevOps, the, you know, the catchphrase of the, the day. So. Uh, do, do, do. This is left, right. So this is that GitHub repo that I've got there, and it's got some pages in there, and it's got a sample page.html. And in that sample page.html, let's go left. It gives you a static page with some accessibility issues. So there's nothing wrong with the top paragraph. This input text less, lacks an accessible label. The color text is wrong and the button uses a tab index greater than zero because someone went and changed it. So it gives you that. Now we're going to run rules on it. We're going to run the WCAG and ARIA rules onto it, and we're going to use two tools. One is I've got a nice little Chrome add in there, Accessibility Insights for Web, which is the main tool that we open sourced, which you can get it as a Chrome extension or an um, Edge Insights extension. And it gives you, you can switch on the uh, automated checks. You can switch off the color headings tab stops and landmarks, but what I want to do here, uh, do, do, do. it's actually in another window, so I want to do fast pass. What fast pass lets you do is uh, check the t top 25% of the uh, requirement for WCAG 2.1 uh, and get you an instant kind of uh, awareness of what you're doing and what you're doing uh, wrong and right. So I'm going to click on that. And it's going to run through here, and it's going to say color contrast wrong, labels wrong, and then it's going to actually go, if I can go there, uh, it's going to highlight it, the exact location of the, the site, and then I can go in there, click through that, it's going to tell me what I can and what is the correct, uh, let's zoom back here, zoom, 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 and then I can go uh, inspect the HTML, get some, uh, hints on how to do it, or I can file the issue straight to GitHub. 
So this is your manual approach. You give it to your testers. Please test my website or test it for me. What about DevOps? So this site here, that, uh, the GitHub site on Visual Studio Code, also includes tests that you can run written in C Sharp and TypeScript. And this will actually test your uh, accessibility, uh, excluding known issues or of a single element, or it can actually test WCAG compliance. So you can actually execute these in Visual Studio Code, the best code editor ever known to man. And then it'll, it'll come back. But you can also run this. Uh, let's get there. You can also run this in Azure DevOps, which means you can run your entire pipeline using the X pipeline samples inside your DevOps process and gives you a view of exactly what you're doing. And then feedback with here, you can see, uh, let's go to the test cases, uh, .NET test, and feedback with the tests of that you've run and the status of them back to your testing team. So one is you can get a view of that with the fast pass. You can even check the tab indexes to make sure they're correct. And two is you can actually put this into Azure DevOps to automate the process. And these are all open source and for free. Test pass three. So it passes. And we've open sourced this and it's available now. AI, that little model on the, the BMI scale. How did that come to be? There was a design session. I'm sure that they sat around in a, in a room and goes, OK, cool. We should really use the word obese in our, in our model. Hey, Nothing wrong can, can happen. But yes, it can. So let's look at exactly how to cater for that. So I've been kind of abusing AI, like that model, for a long time. And I've been kind of sh proving to people that I'm not related to Tyrion Lannister. So this is Azure Cognitive services, and this is uh, face recognition. And you can see that with high confidence, I am not actually Turin Lannister. OK, proven. I also did a talk where I had an Alexa, Amazon Alexa robot, and I was screaming at it. And I was saying, OK, cool, pass me the butter, pass me the butter like Rick and Morty. And it was, a, it's, it was a kind of an epiphany, because I realized that Alexa couldn't actually understand that I was getting uh, quite gruff with it not understanding my South African accent. This is an important concept to understand with AI, because shouldn't Alexa have understood me a little bit more? If I was, had accessibility requirements and I couldn't actually whisper, then shouldn't it understand? Because my expectation ar uh, already from then was that the world would change with me, that it would change with accessibility requirements. Remember at the end of the shopping cart, it changes for you, kind of like these stairs here. These change according to the person that requires them, though. Either you can take the long path or you can just change to the stairs. Obviously, we can see how with ARIA, you can do this the wrong way. So yeah, fail. The basic principle behind that is that for an accessibility, sorry, an AR to be accessible, they have to understand sentiment. They have to understand exactly what the person is feeling. And sentiment is not a zero or one. So it's not a, a happy or, or sad. Sentiment's a little bit more complicated. So what industry started to do is they started to analyze sentiment to feed it into AI. And uh, the core of this is the emotional, um, well, the human emotional uh, spectrum. And you can see here, it's pretty complicated. My favorite is that boredom leads to disgust, leads to loathing. Scientists have shown that uh, boredom is actually an evolutionary trait to actually say that you've been poisoned. Because if you're bored and you've been poisoned, you might want to go out and do something. Have you ever wondered why children who are bored can't sit still? So if you are bored, please, there's a paramedic waiting outside who will give you a shot of Netflix, and then we can carry on with this. But this is the complexity of the human emotional spectrum. So the guys at MIT, they created something called Deep Moji. Um, in 2014, the Secret Service, the American Secret Service, actually said, please ha help us understand sarcasm. So the guys in Deep Mojo realize that sarcasm is a very high form of wit, though, but we already know that the internet's being sarcastic. So they created Deep Moji, and they started scanning tweets. So they scanned 55 billion tweets, and they sanitized it to 1.6 billion. 
and they broke it into categories. And the categories we want to know here, because the Secret Service wants to know, is this face here. We really care about this. And this is the I'm not impressed face, AKA sarcasm. So we scanned the tweets, we fed them into a model, we created an AI. Can this AI understand emotion? Can this AI understand accessibility? So you can go into Deepmoji now. So deepmoji.mit.edu. So immediately I went, the electricity is off again. Oh joy. Sarcasm. And it brought me back the, the actual emotional flow. And then understand, you can actually access this in Docker. And this was a pivotal point because then suddenly now, all these companies realized that they could understand emotionality properly. They started building it into their tools. If you scream at Siri, if you scream at Alexa, if you scream at Katana, do you know what it's going to do? It's going to start to whisper back at you. Because it understands, wait a second, this person's engagement might not be the norm. They might actually be requiring accessibility requirements. And we started building it in. At Microsoft, we have a emotional intelligence team that builds in into emotional intelligence into all our products, especially AR. And we also see that with accessibility, with AI, so this is someone actually speaking to Alexa, but he's using TensorFlow in the browser to scan in his custom hand signals. And this is that last bit there, that uh, AI adjustment. He had custom AI requirements, so he would scan it in his own custom hand signals, and then he would speak to Alexa through that. How do you get started and create this learning from diversity with ARs? One, we already discussed learning, uh, re refine, redefine bias as a spectrum. Two, enlist customers to correct a bias. We scan 55 billion tweets. Cultivate diversity with privacy and consent. You have to actually uh, cultivate privacy. You can't just use data without consent. Balance intelligence and discovery. And finally, build inclusive AI teams. There is no one who is a bigger uh, supporter of accessibility requirements other than someone who is heavily involved with someone with accessibility needs, though. A parent, a mother, uh, a child, all of them, if you have someone who has accessibility uh, needs, you'll be the actual, the biggest evangelist for that. Build your accessibility teams, hire for accessibility, and you'll get to that point that you'll create that innovation. You'll get to the point that you'll create products like this. this is a hackathon that we did at Microsoft, seeing AR that you can put it on an iPhone and can scan your entire area around you, and it can tell you how many people, the barcode, and whether they're happy or sad. You'll also be able to do things like this. My name is Grover. Sean. My name is Ian. I'm Taylor. My name is Owen, and I am nine and a half years old. I only have one. <laughs> and, yeah. I love video games, my friends, my family, and again, video games. Whenever I play it, it makes me feel happy. The fun that you get to have with connecting with your friends. You make your own rules. It's his way of interacting with his friends when he can't physically otherwise do it. When I'm playing with a regular controller, there's some things that don't work for me. It's difficult for me to use both joysticks and the D-pad at the exact same time. And it just slowed me down a bunch more while other people were like oh, do, 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 do. She's never had the freedom to play at the level she knows she could. I never thought it was unfair. I just thought, hey, this is the way it is and it's not gonna change. What I like about the adaptive controller is that now everyone can play. I don't even have to look at the controller and just be like looking at the screen like, hey, yep, yep. You never want your kid to feel like an outsider or an other. One of the biggest fears early on is, how will Owen be viewed by the other kids? <laughs> He's not different when he plays. It's a little challenging, but that's the whole point of gaming. I can hit the buttons just as fast as they can. And I think I can crush my friends. <laughs> no matter how your body is or how fast you are, you can play. It's a really good thing to have in this world. So what we've actually discussed 
is inclusive design, how to get started, the role of inclusive design in your design process, website st standards, the toolings around, it's available for you already, and finally, AI, on how to actually incorporate that and create emotionally intelligent AI. The slides are available um, on Linux Conf because I was way too lazy to actually change it to Postgres Conf. And yeah, I'll be here actually for Python Conf also. And it will be great to discuss accessibility requirements. You can tweet me up on here. And it's my role to actually make developers happy along with also screaming at AI to pass me coffee. So we've got one more minute for questions. Thank you so much. Do we have any questions? Yes. Just wanted to check the tests that you ran there. They they normal command line tests, so that should work with it. Yeah, so it's in units. It's absolutely fine. You can run it self -cont uh, self contained. So all of the the actual the novelty of it is it's running inside Azure DevOps. It's got the libraries which is kind of uh, aware of the the WCAG and ARIA, and it's just feeding back to you. Wait a second. Here's a site. I'm going to start up a uh, a Chrome instance, drive it there, and say how is this rendered on that Chrome instance, and then feed back into your test cases. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.